Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorris, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. And I've discovered on my journey that so much more is possible than we can begin to imagine. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Heal Podcast. Today, I am so excited to talk to Emma Dunwoody. Emma is a human design expert, master coach, behavioral specialist, and the host of the number one global human design podcast. She wakes people up to the power within them using her unique method of transformational human design, a system of self-knowledge and guidance unlike anything else that exists. Her vision is to take human design mainstream so it becomes more widely accepted than any other global profiling, behavioral, or healing system. She believes it will transform personal development, education, and business forever. Emma wants to inspire everyone to unlock their inner wisdom, take their power back, and feel deeply confident in the decisions they make. This will create a population that values themselves and courageously lives their truth, which will deliver us to a new paradigm of peace, joy, and abundance. Well, I am all for that. (laughs) Wow, that's that's epic. I'm kind of like, I'm a little bit like blushing over here. (laughs) Yes, but I mean, I have like you're so passionate about your work and i have just had a taste of human design and it's like rocked my world with resonance of truth and so i'm so excited to dive in and find out you know um i guess first let's talk about what human design is and then um you know find out your personal story of how you came to be a human design expert yeah okay cool so Human design itself, I always love to introduce it sort of in parallel to the things that we're kind of uh, really aware of in the world, and that's these these personality and behavioural profiling tools. So it might be DISC profiling or Myers-Briggs or Enneagram's really big at the moment, um, and human design is similar to that. Now, all of these other modalities, we we enter these things through our mind. What do I mean? We have to answer questions. We answer the questions of who we think we are. Um, and and our profile spits out the other end. Now with human design, it's an energetic blueprint that is taken from a a, a, a moment in time. And that moment in time is our birth where we have these subatomic particles that move through our body that leave an imprint on us. Now that becomes our energetic blueprint and the mind at no point gets involved. So it's not who we think we are, it's who we're energetically mapped to um, to be or how we're, we're designed to bring Um, our essence to life so human design is all about bringing together these four wisdoms of western astrology the hindu chakra system the kabbalah tree of life um, and the um, chinese i ching and all four of these wisdoms are incredibly ancient and powerful on their own however with human design what happens is that all four of them are mathematically mapped together So it's like, it's just intense. There's a lot of information. It can be complicated. However, my mission is to make it simple because ultimately what human design is in its simplest form is your most authentic permission slip to be you. Mm, I love it. (laughs) I need that permission slip. Um, So how did you come to discover human design? What's your personal story and to, to, to know that this is your work and your life's passion? Yeah, so I I love this question because um, <clears throat> unlike a lot of people, it wasn't love at first sight. You know, I human design came to me a few times before I actually picked it up, and I put it straight back down because I was a behavioralist. I'm trained in things like NLP. The language was very very negative, and um, there was there were kind of a lot of things. I was like, oh God, I know that's true, but I don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. So like so many people, I kept putting it down and kept putting it down. However, I got to a point in my life where I'd completely transformed my my life. I'd healed my mental health. I'd moved out of the advertising industry and I'd created a very successful coaching business after training to become a master coach. Um, we had moved from the country and to move to Sydney. Like our kids were really happy. Um, we'd, we'd navigated a relationship uh, challenge, all those things. And I just found myself going, 
shouldn't I feel better on the inside? Like this is massive, epic change in my life, but I still feel like there's this hole inside of me. So I put out to the universe, okay, universe, you need to be really obvious with me. Like you need to smack me in the face. You need to be very clear because I know I'm in the right realm. I know I've trained, I'm heading in the right path, but there's something very specific missing. Now, at that time, as I said, human design had been introduced to me, but because I was so science driven, it was like, oh, there's not enough science. There's not enough. Da, da, da. Um, so I just disregarded it. But the truth is that there's a lot of science. There's a lot of evidentiary proof. Like at the moment, we we now know that the Chinese I Ching, which is the, the book of changes, the 64 ways a human being can transform. We now know that this is mapped back to the human codon. So we're starting to see that science and spirituality in so many places, and I'm sure you talk about this a lot, you know, they are actually very, very entwined. So um, off I went to hike or uh, walk a pilgrimage for 800 kilometers with this big like universe you need to smack me in the face you need to tell me exactly what it is <laughs> and I walked all this way and I let go of a lot of my old dogmas this this need for for proof for it to be in front of my face to see things um and what happened was on this journey I really let go of this old identity that I have to be very very science-based and what I did is I stepped into this this beautiful evolution if I can bring science and spirituality together when I got home in the 48 hours of getting home, human design was everywhere in my life. Now, human design was not popular like it is now. Back then, there was like two people doing it in Australia, or at least two renowned people doing it in Australia. That was it. And as it turns out, because I'd made a commitment to the universe, if you show me what it is that you want me to do, and it show and she showed me human design, I promised to do it. So I started my experiment. So human design is all about experiment. Like you, you learn the knowledge, then you have to run the experiment to see what works for you. Um, and in the three days that I got back from Spain, not only had I promised the universe that I would run this experiment, I'd gone down the rabbit hole. I'd found the leading human design specialist in Australia. She lived one suburb away from me and I had coffee with her all in this really short period of time. And I was like, Oh, that's what flow feels like. And from a human design perspective, that's what it looks like when I follow my strategy and authority. So I just kept running the experiment and here I am today. Wow. And did you did you mention this? Were you on the road? What is that called? The El Camino? The yeah, the, the, the Camino. Yes. The it's the French I did the French way. So from the Pyrenees Mountains, um, along the down, I'm sorry, up and over and along the top of Spain. So yeah, the Camino de Santiago. Oh my gosh. I made a pact with my friend Carmen. We lived I mean Carmel. We lived uh, in San Sebastian, Spain, and we were like, when we're 30, we're coming back and doing the Camino and El yeah. Camino. And we never did, but we'll, we'll, I, it, this is a sign. Do it. Got to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to be there forever. So uh, I've done it twice and I will absolutely do it again. It's epic. That's amazing. Yeah. And I love when you, um, I love how you commanded or asked. You were so clear. You're like, I know I'm onto something, but there's something missing. So show me what that is. And then all the flow unfolded to just give you that, you know, confidence that you were on, on the case, on the right track. Yeah. And I think the other piece for me is that that I had to put my own ego aside. You know, in when human design had come to me the first few times, that's the universe giving me the opportunity to fill the hole. But I was so attached to my identity of what that thing had to look like. By the time I'd walked the Camino, I'd, I'd learned so much about letting go, about letting the universe um, provide. On the Camino, there's literally a saying that says the Camino will provide. So mm -hmm. I'd had 32 days of you know, facing a challenge and it's serendipitously working itself out, like me not having to effort at everything. So I think that one of the really big lessons for me was, okay, you need to put your ego aside. The universe is showing you, you need to stop like batting it back over the net and actually pick it up and run with it. So, you know, do the work that, that she's showing you you're here to do as opposed to, you know, making a mental decision, which is really what human design is all about. It's about shifting our decision-making from the mind and into the body. Yes. And it's so, I mean, just the fact that it's this, I mean, I just think the language of the universe is, is mathematics and energy and everything is, is able to like spirituality is able to be explained through those scientific lenses um, and equations. And I just, I mean, that to me is mind blowing and also very reassuring that there's an order to all of this yeah. <laughs> that is beyond our comprehension, but we get little tastes and it's pretty remarkable. Um, yeah. 
so the fact that all four of those wisdom teachings overlapped into this, it's just like, and, and there's probably 25 more, but that's just what our level of understanding is able to compute at this time in history, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think the thing that fascinates me is, you know, some of the naysayers that come to human design, the thing that that, that will say, because it's a challenged, sorry, a channeled wisdom. So mm -hmm. like A Course in Miracles, this was information that came through an individual. And people will be like, yeah, what do you mean? He just made it up over eight days. The thing that people have to understand that these are four ancient wisdoms. They've been around forever and they've been mathematically mapped together. Some human brain is not working that out in eight days. Let me right. be very clear. So for me, that's when I started. It's really started to crack that whole, um, you know, it's the old condition paradigm that if we can't see it, it's not real. And that is absolutely not true. Um, and so a lot of the ways that human design has really demonstrated to me is, you know, that, that Wayne Dyer quote, you know, it's not um, I'll believe it when I see it. It's I'll see it when I believe it. Mm -hmm. Totally. So for people that don't know kind of how human design looks or how it can kind of help you come to know thyself, um, you want to talk about the five types just to lay out yeah. the, the foundation and then um, we'll go from there. Sounds cool. So the thing with human design is like any of these modalities, we've got to start somewhere. So because of its nature and it's got a lot of depth and sort of um, complexity to it, we start with the five types. Now, what the five types give us, I love to talk of it through talk about it through this frame. It gives us this, it's almost like the container of our purpose, this, this idea of um, how our energy works and what we're on the world on the planet to do, what we're in this lifetime to do. But in a very, you know, very broad sense, because the deeper we go into our chart, the more specific we get. So a large part of our um our experimentation is going deeper and deeper and deeper till we get to a place like for me, for example. I'm a 3-5 emotional manifesting generator. Manifesting generators are on the planet to demonstrate human potential. But the deeper I go, like my real core talent is the, is the talent of insight, of breakthrough. So this, this piece that's so detailed, there's all these other layers that complement that, but we can go super, super deep as well. So we want to start so we don't overwhelm the brain because the brain you know, whenever you feel or hear the word overwhelm, the, the code for that, like the thinking code for that, all that means is that we, we lack clarity. So we want to take one step at a time. We want to build clarity along the way. So we always start with, um, with type. So the five types, we've got the manifester, the generator, the hybrid, which is the manifesting generator. Then we've got the projector. And then we have the reflector. Um, so you're a projector. Um, and the five types give us how our energy kind of works. So, <clears throat> and I just want to say that just because only one of them is called a manifester, well, two of them, manifesting generator, doesn't mean that they're the only ones that can manifest. We all manifest. We all have the power to do it. But what human design teaches us is what our energetic blueprint tells us the best way to do that is. So as a manifester, these people are here to be the trailblazers. Um, these are the people that are going to shake things up, find new ways, um, be the trendsetters, all of these sort of things. So these people, they have to be very careful because as a kid, they would have been very independent. They knew what they wanted. And that in many uh, Western cultures, that's not OK. So it's a lot of the time that's been shut down in the manifesto. So you very much need to be the person that, um, you know, that, that, is very uniquely you. You need to be unapologetically you and understand that you have very specific people in your lifetime that you are here to inspire into action. And then once they're inspired, they can start to really build on the thing that you've started. Then we have the generators. So the generators make up, um, the with the generators and the manifesting generators, that's 70% of the global population. And this type is really all about creating the life force energy for planet Earth. These are the people that are going to be, once they're inspired, they're going to build. They're going to create something. They're going to be lit up and excited by the work that they do. These are people that, you know, often in my experience, I mean, I'm a mother of two and through coaching, so many people over the years, I think one of the challenges the generators have as mothers is that they feel this guilt because they really want to work and they really want to be a mother, 
but there's this part of them that that is it's important that they do the work that they're here to do now the important thing for generators is you have to do work that lights you up not the work that you're conditioned to do because then this life force energy that you're actually setting for the entire planet isn't really at its you know its potential it's not um at its greatest influence if you like then we have the manifesting generator which is the hybrid between the two the manifester and the generator and as i said they're here to demonstrate human potential these people are non-linear beings now this completely blew my mind because it changed my life in one sentence being an mg myself you know like when i was at school being told that i had to pick one thing to do for the rest of my life i was like yeah that's not going to happen you know i'd rather <laughs> like poke myself in the eye than do that um and these are the people that are going to be multi-passionate. They won't be able to decide between one business or the other. They'll do both. Um, and that's perfectly okay. These people are really about going through life and almost like, I love to say like making a mess. They break things. They're like, mm, there's a better way of doing it. Oh, I don't like that. Um, so they, they, they will tend to be people who take quantum leaps, but sometimes they're just in the mess because they're kind of breaking things to work out what a better way of doing things is. So the manifesting generator, these are the people that you you know they when they walk in the room. They have this very big energy. Um, yeah, I'm a very passionate, big, enthusiastic energy, even though I'm very introverted and actually quite a, a little human myself. My energy is very big. Mm -hmm. Then we have the projectors. So projectors are, you know, one of the types that they're actually on the planet to guide us. They have this innate wisdom to see the way we are using our energy. Are we using it efficiently? Are we using it in alignment to our authenticity or are we using it from a conditioned um, perspective? These are the people that they can actually see into things so much better than many other people. The challenge for the projector, they're here to be wise. They're here to be seen. They're here to be recognized. However, they need to be invited in. So what happens is we have these really wise souls that are trying so hard to be seen and recognized because they're trying so hard to be seen and recognized for their wisdom. People don't want to see them. They don't want to invite them in. So I, I encourage all of you, if you're into human design, if you've got projectors in your life, then you want to invite them in. Because the thing is, is that projectors have their very specific people. And if you are, you know, the projectors in my life, if they tell me something, I will literally take a moment, sit down, listen to them, put all my attention on them because they're going to see something that I can't see. And as a manifesting generator, I love to run around. I often say like, I'm just going to run around and bang into walls for a while. And then I get to a point where I'm like, right, what do you see? What am I not seeing? So our projectors really need to be invited in because they also are not designed to work this nine to five. They're not designed to work the hours that a generator or a manifesting generator are designed to work. So it less is more for the projector. And then we have the reflector. Now, reflectors are only 1% of the global population. Mm. These people are hugely powerful. And in the human design world, I, I have kind of this mission to really serve the reflectors. Even though these guys are only 1%, the thing that I want them to understand is they're hugely powerful. Nobody dances with energy the way reflectors do. It's like they are plugged into everybody's energy, everything's energy, the energy of spaces, environments, everything. They can see and feel the future like no person's business. It's incredible. However, they are constantly taking in, amplifying and reflecting back everybody else's energy, which means that if you're a reflector and you live in a world that says, what's your why? What's your purpose? Know who you are. That's going to feel really uncomfortable because you're going to be this chameleon that, that, that changes and evolves depending on what environment you're in or what people you're with. So a large part of the role of the reflector is to show us the truth. The truth, they reflect back the truth of people, places and environments. And if you're a reflector and if you're in one of these, you know, in the environment or with these people and they make you feel not great, then it's time for you to move on because you want to be amplifying the energy that we want the planet to move toward, not the energy that we're letting go of. Mm. And so do you, where, where can people, I know everybody's like, oh, I want to find out what, um, what I am, what, what, what human design tests do you recommend? Do you offer one? So, well, yes, there's one on my website. You can just go to emmadunwoody.com and we've actually set it up in a way that you can go there, get your free chart. And then we're going to send you an email 
And we're going to drip feed you because we don't want to overwhelm you. And we'll send you off to the correct podcast for your type and the correct podcast for your um, authority. Like we actually send you to the right places so that you can start running your experiments straight away. Amazing. Um, and what's like an example, I guess we can just start to go now that we've got like the broader sense and we can go deeper into like authority and strategy and stuff. But before I do that, I just, you know, again, it's like, what if someone, what do you say to someone who's like, I, I'm definitely, I, I for sure would have thought that I'm a projector when I'm a generator or a manifesting generator. Cause I'm, I thought for sure my husband was a manifesting generator. Cause he's just like this endless energizer bunny and he's a manifester and you know i was just taking things literally um we don't know his birth time but we ran a bunch over the window that we thought it was and he was a projector as well so yeah what do you say to people that are like i don't know it doesn't really resonate i mean obviously going deeper probably does but so i this is such a great question and this this so the example with your husband what i think is really what would be fascinating is how your charts come together because how our charts, we call them the, a connection chart. So how our um, charts come together is a really big, um, you know, influence. So together, you two might actually have the energy of a manifesting generator. You know, like you might actually give each other the energy that you guys need. Like um, two of my favorite humans uh, who also happen to be my personal trainers run this incredible business. Like, um, they are some of the best personal trainers you're ever going to come across in your entire life. And one of them's a mental projector and one of them's a, um, a self-directed projector. What that means is they have very little definition. So in, you know, um, in the, when we talk about their singular defini definition, you're like, how do these girls have the energy that they have? Like, it doesn't make sense. However, when you put the two of them together, they're a fully defined manifesting generator that with everything defined, meaning that all centers are defined, all motors are going, everything's happening. Wow. So together they are these powerhouse. It's just when they're apart, when they're out of aura um, or when they're not in anyone else's aura, they're not amplifying anyone else's energy or each other's energy, meaning that they don't have that consistently. Now, that can be one thing. The other thing, and this is what I experienced, it's why I put human design down so many times in the, in the beginning, is that often we come to human design and we'll be like, oh, well, and I, for me, I was like, oh, I don't want to be a manifesting generator. I want to be a projector. Like that sounds so much better. I mean, I was like, oh, I don't want to be a line three. That sounds really awful. What's this trial and error thing? Ugh. Um, and at the same time, there was this part of me that was going, oh, God, don't tell me all the bad stuff about myself. Or, And what I actually discovered over time was, and now I've run this experiment with thousands of clients, is that whether you like it or not, I'm going to say 95% of the time, it's just an indication of exactly how and where you're resisting being you, mm. you know? And, <laughs> and for, for me, like that was exactly the thing. Like I wanted to be the one that sit, sat on the cushion like Yoda over in the corner and just dish out wisdom. Like oh, that sounded so much better. But the truth for me is that that's not my energy. Like I'm charismatic, I'm impactful, I have this big energy. Um, so I had to learn to go... All right, I have to heal everything that's stopping me from being big, from from taking up space. And this mentor I talked about earlier, I remember that my first training I ever did, and I did my first certification with her. I was, I would every time I'd come on, I'd go, oh, "I'll just be quick." Um, I'll just, and she would, she just turned around one day and went, "For goodness sake, Emma, just take up space. That's what you're here to do." So I think in many cases, when we come to human design, the resistance is actually just giving us yet another map into the areas of ourselves that we are resisting or we're afraid of showing, like we're just keeping that stuff in our shadow. So true. I think learning that, that I was a projector and, you know, and even just if you go like take one of the pillars, astrology, you know, it's, it shows that I'm meant to be a healer, but I'm not meant to be a hands-on nine to five working with my hands healer. I'm meant to be a experience with my own experience and then share with the world, which I learned that after I made heal. So it was like, okay, well, that's clearly <laughs> I'm yeah. on path with that. Um, but then as you learn human design, it gave me permission to do two things that I hadn't because of my conditioning allowed myself to do. And it's helping me, it's still a process, I'm not, um, to learn how to 
really like you learned how to take up space. I'm learning how to give myself permission to rest. Yeah. And, you know, and I am so extroverted, but I'm equally parts introverted and need to like, I need deep solitude because I take on so much energy and I need to let that go um, and decompress. And so to learn about yourself in this way, it gives yourself permission, you know, it cuts through all the societal pressures and conditioning and um, that you've grown up with and these ideas about how you should be in the world and really gives you permission to like, oh, if I want to reach my potential and be most efficient, I, I better pay attention to these qualities that I'm ignoring and stuffing down. And that's why I'm burnt out all the time or whatever. Yeah. And the thing that I love is like, <clears throat> the question I have for you is, did you already innately know that? Did you already innately know within you that you potentially needed more rest than others, yet you were just ignoring it? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just love alone time. And I, um, but I was, conf I was confused myself because I like love to be the center of attention and then also like love to be alone and, and love to nap and love to just read a book and not be productive. But I just have this yeah. overachieving productivity thing that, if you know, there's only so much time and I can only accomplish so much and I will only be fully loved and worth it, <laughs> worthy yeah. and enough until I get here. You know what I mean? So I didn't have, I didn't have time to rest or I didn't think yeah. that, that was productive. Now I understand that rest is sometimes and often the most productive thing I can do. Exactly. And so much for you is like rest is the gaps. You know, it's the gaps that the Buddhists talk about. It's the gaps that we search for in, in our meditation um, you know, for projectors, what are you here to be? Wise. So you need lots of gaps because gaps are where the wisdom gets in. Gaps are where, is where source comes in. And the thing I love about human design is that it also answers those questions like you just said, am I extroverted? Am I introverted? And we can look at your design and go, well, you're a one three. So both, you know, like the one is someone who's going to be more um, internally reflective. They're going to be someone who goes internal. They're super sensitive. They they see all the, the details that are going on out there, but they'll also be the ones that tend to keep to themselves. They want to go internal. Yet the line three is more about out there being the, the entertainer. It's about pleasure, adventure, challenge. So you have both, you know, you have both of these things and that productivity piece, well, that's got so much to do with the fact that you've got a, a defined root center. And in many you know, many people who are into human design, they hear like projectors have no energy at all. They have none and they just have to be like really. And I call BS on that. You know, that's not true. Um, so many projectors I know have a lot of energy. And in your case, you do have a lot of very powerful productive energy because you've got a defined root center. So what that means is that you have this consistent energy to get stuff done, to move life forward. However, you also have to balance it because you've got a lot of undefined centers. You're a projector. So that means because you spend so much of your life taking in other people's energy, you need the equal amount, if not more time, to cleanse that energy, to let it go. And as a projector, you need time to be obsessing over whatever it is that you love. I mean, the whole heel movie documentary, that's a projector. Like, I have to get to the bottom of this. I have to understand it, you know. So it's this balance. And when we talk about the work with projectors, it's almost, we always have to put like, imagine the old school nine to five sitting at an office. You've got about three hours of that kind of work, three hours of book work or admin. That's about all you've got um, to be really healthy and well in a day. But the rest of the day, like you could spend 10 hours going down the rabbit hole on, you know, mystical something or other, and you you will feel really energized. Um, but you there you are in your aura doing the thing that you love. And that's giving you energy, not depleting your energy. Totally. And this is this is why I love, I mean, I I love human design because it's so specific and it really you know, we put ourselves into boxes and, you know, should ourselves all day long. And like, just here's another example of where human design and understanding my human design gave me like, liberated me from a self judgment that I've had my whole life. So I've been a crammer um, and I study, but I have this like kind of photographic memory, but it's not for very long. It's like a, I can look at a page, remember where the word and remember where the sentence is, and it can reproduce it for a test. So I've been a great test taker my whole life. I've gotten straight A's, went to Berkeley, maybe got one B my first two years at Berkeley. And it's because I could cram the night before. 
I could spend three hours, that three hour work window that you said, you know, from 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. And then I get up, take the test, get the A and not retain a darn thing. But I beat my or finish a project that I had a month to do and I do it in the final three days leading up to the thing. I I beat myself up for years because as a procrastinator, I was like such a negative thing. And when I looked at when I was first at human design, I learned and you could tell me the exact um, specifics of it, but it's something about like I I make decisions with my intuition. And so that clicked in me. Oh, I set myself up in pressure pressure situations so that I was forced to use my intuition that I didn't trust. I was like, oh, I only have three hours or I only have three days to do six weeks of work. I'm just going to. I'm, I'm in a heat, I'm in a fire, and I'm just going to have to use my intuition. And I was like, oh, so it's like, it's just a reframe of how you operate and then gives you permission not to beat yourself up. It's like, oh, now I understand. That's just the way I'm designed. And maybe exactly. I could do healthier, healthier habits around that, but, or I could just not have the negative story, you know, and just let myself be me. I love this so much because, you know, my own personal experience, but also all these people I've worked with, the, one of the most common things I see is that people are beating themselves up for their superpowers. So one of your superpowers is to cram, yet we are conditioned to think it's a bad thing. Um, how specifically is it bad for you? Uh, the results is telling us that you did something, you took an action and you got good marks, you got what you wanted that was resourceful, that actually served you. How is that wrong? And I think that that's one of the things with human design is that we we all of a sudden we reframe everything. We understand that, hang on, that is actually your superpower. And I want to bring some behavioral science into this as well. It's that the human brain works best after under pressure. Most people will leave anything and everything to the last minute when it comes to studying, in fact, any deadlines, because that's the way the, the brain works the best. Our brain works the best under pressure. It's just that we've been conditioned at school that we have to do it in this certain way. And again, I call BS on it. We all have our own unique way. I mean, human design is called the science of differentiation. So it's all about understanding our unique differences and how our differences work. And I love that you've also made that awareness that it puts you into this place where it's almost like the mind, the conditioned mind went, well, I give up. I told you how you should do it. So in that same moment the intuition goes yeah well actually i'm the one that's meant to be making decisions you know you're a splenic projector that means that you're you make decisions on your intuition spontaneously in the moment from knowing you know not the the um analysis paralysis not the four columns you know you know must have don't want all the things it's all about in the moment knowing and when you make those decisions then you get to where you want to go or you feel more fulfilled or you you know your results shift and i think that that's the thing we need to be paying attention to i mean i don't talk about good or bad right or wrong i talk about resourceful or unresourceful because at the end of the day we have to stop assuming that the way we've been taught is correct for us because in many cases it's not it's just our conditioning mm -hmm. so what we actually need to choose to do is see everything through this frame of is it resourceful is it sustainable is it moving it me forward am i growing and evolving um you know is this deepening my connection to myself to others or is it unresourceful meaning it's unsustainable it's keeping me stuck i'm in fear i you know, all of these things. And when you actually look at it through that frame, well, your study strategy is perfect. It's spot on because it got you where you wanted to go. It's sustainable because you're not studying for weeks and months and depleting your energy. Actually, that last, you know, um, ditch effort is exactly how your energy is designed. So yeah, we, we need to stop looking at right and wrong and actually look at the results. Is this resourceful for me or is it not resourceful for me? Yeah. And you can see, like I've compared and beat myself up, like I'm not as organized as so-and-so, or there's other people that like need that organization and the perfect penmanship and the the right, you know, and have everything that, uh, that I'm in awe of and their life is like very orderly, <laughs> but that's the way they're designed. And that's just exactly. not the way I'm designed and that's okay to both. And be maybe it's not, you see, maybe it's not the way it's designed because it's, it's the way we're conditioned, you know, perfectionism mm. is, is a conditioned thing. You know, one of my favorite uh, quotes is that perfectionism you know perfection is a serial killer because it's constantly killing our creativity so 
and we're conditioned to be perfect. So that's something we all need to throw out. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so real quickly, back to this connection, I think, chart, because I know astrology can do like a compatibility chart. Connect, I mean, if you're getting even more of the four wisdoms, like human design connection is going to be much more specific. So, and it would just give you a lot of information on how you need to be, whether, you know, on the very basic level, like love languages, but also just how, um, I guess you could see like levels of amplification of energy or if, I mean, have you ever seen charts that are like, oh gosh, I don't care what strategies you have. It's not going to work. I love this question and I get it all the time because again, we're in the past, there's so many people, you know, saying like, if you're a Pisces, you're compatible with the cancer. Like it doesn't work that way. And as a behavioralist, I don't believe in it. And I think it's really unresourceful because it's a belief system because every single relationship that comes into our life is a soulmate because every single relationship that comes into our life is here to teach us something so that we can become an even better version of ourselves, more aligned to our soul. Whether we take those lessons, learn them and evolve or not, that's totally our choice. Now, the thing about a chart is there are parts of um, a connection chart. We call them electromagnetics where, um, you know, I have one gate and don't worry people if you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's fine. Just come along for the ride. You know, I have one gate, one energy, and then my partner might have the other gate and these two connect in what we call a channel. Um, that's what we feel when we feel sparks when we first meet someone, you know, like, oh, there was a lot of sparks. They're our, our electromagnetics joining. Now, the thing is with that is that in many cases, because these electromagnetics are actually opposites, in many cases, the things that draw us to someone are also the things that are going to drive us away from someone because they're the opposites. So what human design does when we look at our connection chart is not only can we break the golden rule, Rule, that is treat everyone as though the way we would like to be treated we want to break that rule and we want to start treating people as they are designed to be treated because we see the world as we are not as it is so once we understand another person's human design then we can treat them very differently so let me give you an example if you're a manifesting generator someone like me i'm a three five manifesting generator i've got a defined will center a defined emotional solar plexus so i've got a big energy i'm impactful and i just feel like everybody wants to change the world like doesn't everybody want to like go out there and completely change the world the truth is no they don't so if i'm in relationship with someone then i assume that my partner is this way now, what human design does is it gives me the map of this other person. It gives us all the map of the other person so we can start to understand them. So let's say um, I'm a with a projector. Well, I know that this person needs to be seen and recognized and invited in. I need to, you know, understand that this person's energy certainly isn't the same as my energy. So all of a sudden, I'm not projecting who I am onto my partner. I'm actually seeing my partner for who they really are. Now, some of the really cool things that human design gives us, for example, in like in relationships, as I said earlier, I'm an emotional authority. So anyone in relationship with me is going to be in an emotional relationship. What does that mean? That means that someone in that relationship, let's say, gets triggered. The last thing I need to do is sit down and unpack that trigger right there in that moment because an emotional authority is all about making decisions over time so what happens if you have an emotional connection if you have a, so a defined solar plexus in your relationship you need to have the opportunity to say okay i see i may have hurt you or i'm feeling hurt right now um this is really important i, I want to talk about it can we talk about it tomorrow can i just let my emotional wave you know go work out and like when i was younger like this this makes so much sense because i would because i just at that stage, it was a people pleaser. I didn't want anyone not to like me. So I was like, oh, we got to fix it. So yeah. I would say things and do things that just weren't true um, instead of just letting the wave settle and then be able to go back and address whatever the thing is, you know, the following day. So when we look at our connection charts, then we can really start to understand um, our partner and our relationship. Because when we look at the two charts together, wherever we don't have definition which is this colored in part of our chart like a colored in chakra 
um, this is going to be where that relationship is going to do its most evolution, its most work, probably where you'll find the most challenge because there's nothing consistent in there. So that's going to be the part of the, the relationship. Um, for example, um, I'm actually separated from my husband now, but our chart together was that we have a, an undefined G center, which is all about love. So a large part of our relationship has been about lovability. You know, like I felt like I'm not lovable. He's felt like he's not lovable. Um, and we've gone through a lot of journeys, um, a, you know, around that um, that topic, if you like, and really evolved as humans and sort of come to this place where we're like, wow, I am lovable and you're lovable, but maybe we don't want to continue on this journey together and in the way that we've even separated it's been a very loving and supportive way because this, this is the thing we've been working on for the last 25 years so um yeah connection charts are really powerful when it comes to relationships and why do you think like so many i'm just witnessing so many relationships like come to an end right now i mean what is your sense what are you seeing in human design what is your sense and just like I mean, it just feels like the frequency is rising and like people's truths are kind of being forced, squeezed out by the energetic magnetic frequency. Um, what yeah. is your sense on that? So human design, my, my interpretation of human design has a partial answer for this, but intuitively, you know, that that is something that I'm seeing a lot as well. And the shift is, and this is this is true for me in um, in my relationship, is that we are all evolving in this place where one of us is evolving quite quickly. And then the other one is like, yeah, I want to come along or I don't want to come along. And we get to this place where we're kind of like, well, we live in a quantum reality and I want to go there. I really want to go up there. But if we are in, you know, quantumly entangled with someone who's like, yeah, I'm good then that becomes an issue. It's just the way it works. It's the way quantum physics and energy works. And I think what I'm seeing, and I'm here, like, I hear this sentence a lot in the last 12 months. I've heard this a lot. I'm like, I hear women say, he's such a good man. I love him. He's so kind, you know, and this is my story almost, you know, um, but, you know, I want so much more. And I think that there is this place and it doesn't just have to be, you know, man, the, the women saying this, it's both the divine feminine is rising in all of us. And I think we're really discovering that we can want more, we can long for more, we can um, choose to reach for more. And I think the challenge is that because there's nothing significantly broken, which was our, this is really representative of my marriage and um, it falling apart, it's, it, the hardest part is because no one did anything significant to hurt the other one. There wasn't like someone did something, you know, not that I love this word, wrong. Yeah. We're just in this place where it's a choice that we're making to go in a different direction. Um, and, you know, we have kids. So that choice is it's a really, really it's something that we've thought about and discussed at length for a long time because we don't want to, you know, damage. That's a terrible word, but we don't yeah. want to, you know, condition our children in any specific way. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we also want to empower our children to make the right choices for them. Now, I want to put the frame of human design over this without overcomplicating it too much, is that we're moving into this new time, human design, we call it uh, the new paradigm in 2027. Um, now we hear the age of astrol uh, sorry, the age of um, Aquarius. We, we know that there's a lot of significant things happening from you know the Mayan calendar perspective. You know, any ancient wisdom, it talks about this time somewhere around 2026, 2027, that there's this big shift happening globally. Um, and a lot of them talk about that we're moving into this golden age, which is why we're experiencing so much chaos right now, because the old has to fall away. Now, human design, we're moving into a time that is going to be governed by some very specific themes, abundance, intimacy, self-empowerment um, and presence. Now, what I think this is all about, I think this is why we're seeing intimacy, sexuality, how we relate to the other that we're in this time right now that it used to be the old paradigm was man and woman. Now we're in this time where it's, well, I'm human and I want to love another human. And we're, we're in this time where that we, we are making sure that we use the right pronouns because we want to be able to, to recognize people as they are. 
what I believe, what I feel the new paradigm is going to be about is that all the labels are going to fall away because we're moving to this place where intimacy is going to be redefined. Intimacy isn't going to be about making babies anymore, which is really how it has been playing out for the majority of history, right? That's really procreation. That's what it's been about. And now we're seeing this evidence of like, no, it's about one soul connecting with another soul, one heart connecting with another heart. The the gender piece is falling away. Less people are wanting to have children. It's not something we have to do. So as we go into the new paradigm, we're actually redefining what intimacy looks like. Um, And I believe that that's why we're seeing this, you know, everything when it comes to intimacy is changing and giving ourselves permission to fully be on that journey and not know the answer and, you know, run the experiment, I think is a really important place to be at this time in the planet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I see this like kind of for lack of a better um, metaphor, it's like the pimple is popping of all the, Mm -hmm. the disconnection and the, the disallowance of people's humanity. And so like, you know, the othering and the, the cancel culture and this disconnection and this isolation is going to get the equal and opposite um, reaction of, of true human connection and acceptance and yeah. less judgment labels, everything like you said. And, and, you know, for me, it's, it's like really reconnecting to myself and, um, you know, human design is like such a beautiful tool to be able to do that. And then once you reconnect with yourself and understand yourself in that way, you can go, oh, and that person is just designed differently. And you have so much more compassion for exactly. all humans, you know? I think that, that like I, um, and again, it's one of the um, the Cidic states for, through the form of this. So again, I, I don't want to overcomplicate, but there's this other beautiful modality, the gene keys. If you haven't heard of it, look it up. Richard Rudd, amazing, which w- it works with human design. And, you know, one of the, the things that um, is in my chart is this, this Cidic state, so the enlightened state. So, you know, I'm not there all the time. I get little flashes of it, um, of compassion, of really understanding the other, you know. And, and what I believe is human design has this great gift of teaching us how to be truly compassionate. Um, it gives us the opportunity to really see how beautiful the differences in others are and how, um, you know, for so long we haven't really been seeing each other. We've been seeing each other through the way our brain works and and we see the world as we are, not as it is. That's just the way we've been designed to keep us safe. But now we're moving into this time where we're actually getting to know ourselves better than we've ever known ourselves before we're actually understanding that we are the biggest priority in our life and that's not selfish and when we focus in on ourselves and healing ourselves and getting onto our path like I work a lot with purpose really understanding our purpose and being our purpose in the world then all we want to do is give it all we want to do is be compassionate all these these higher you know expressions of ourselves they will inevitably evolve but first we have to love trust and accept ourselves because the re- the reality and i do use that i call these inverted commas i can't remember what you guys call them but quotations, um, yeah, quotations, air quotations air quotes, yeah, air yeah. quotes um you know reality isn't real our reality is just how we it's our internal um world being expressed through our senses externally through our projection of our mind externally and i think that we are starting to see that how this whole spiritual idea of oneness, like for me, I'm like, oh, I get it now. Like I'm starting to understand, like we really are all connected, but the, 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 the paradox is it's in our in identifying ourselves individually, like who we really are is the window into understanding how, how, I mean, we just really are each other. We are one. Mm -hmm. And it's like this paradox that I feel like I've, doesn't make sense to me and it's really starting to make sense to me now Mm, I love that um maybe based on my chart just you can so other people can kind of go through this their own exercise I have this um I've always had this like sense that I've wanted to live like 
30 different lives in this and and one is not enough like i'm always i love change i love adventure i love and i think this is why i went into acting because i just wanted to try on all the different hats and the roles and live in that period of time and put on that outfit and do this and i just you know and i don't know if it's a past life thing or you know but i've like had dr vivid dreams of being like a civil war soldier and like i just i want to i it like kill it breaks my heart that i can't have lived in every like epoch of of history yeah. you know yeah so is there something in my chart that that yes. is, <laughs> says why yes well there's so many actually but specifically for you it's in your profile so the profile in our human design chart the two little numbers that we have we might have a six two a five one a three five and in your case it's a one three um and it's the three so whenever we have a three in our in our profile and interestingly you also because we have these line numbers throughout our chart um you also have lots of them i was going to say you have it in your um core talent but you also you're driven by it um it's it, it's all over your chart so what that means is so much of your uh life is going to be about adventure when we have a three in our profile we're going to be people who don't want to live a conventional life in fact we find it easier because i'm also a line three it, it's much easier to be like yeah i'm going to break that and move on i'm going to it's much easier for us to start over where we're the sort of people who don't want to put down roots. It's something that I really wrestled with for years. Like we bought a house, you know, um, back in our early thirties and it was the worst thing I ever did. I felt so confined and trapped. I couldn't stand it. Um, and now I'm just about to turn 49. Like we've rented, we've done all the things and it's just now that I'm like, okay, I'm going to buy a house, but the house is because I've found the place that, um, I want all the family to come back to, and it's the place that we just come back to. It's We're not living there full time. That's not a thing. That's never going to be a thing for me. And the line three is someone who wants to get out in the world and experiment. And this is this energy of these are people who are always going to have some level of, you know, um, trial and error because they want to throw paint at a wall. They want to see what happens when they poke things and try things, and they're not always going to get it. Um, the first time or the second time. I know for me personally, and I sometimes wonder if it's the belief system that I've created, often I'll try things three times before I really get the hang of it, before I'm like, okay, now I'm starting to understand it. You know, I'll get it the first time easy and then I won't be able to replicate it for a few times. And that's the line three. And the line three will also, you know, the shadow of the line three, the line three does want to be seen. It wants to be acknowledged. It, it, it's this, It's this leadership energy, but it also has a, a sense of almost um, there's a little bit of immaturity in it because it's the one, two, and the three. Like these are the self-focused energies. So for you, a large part of your life is all about your personal journey. And being, a, you know, a woman in the Western world, um, you know, of the generation that you're in, you're probably not, you've never given yourself permission to go, hang on, this is really about me. Like the people out there, the people I'm going to serve, they want my knowledge, my experiences. So I have to go and have those things before I can share them with the world. So yeah, you have lots of line threes everywhere, which is going to tend to be the person that wants to, you know, they call it make and break bonds. So you will tend to be that friend that maybe your best friends at school and then you don't see them for 10 years and then you bump into them and you're like, hey, how are you going? And they're like annoyed at you because you didn't keep in contact and you're like, <laughs> what do you mean? Like we're here right now. How are you doing? <laughs> so it's this real sort of adventurer. Um, you know, they don't have too much, like not, they don't tend to be very attached to anything because they're like, well, but what's the next thing? Mm -hmm. I know it's wild. I'm like, I want to live in this house and I want to die in this house and I want to live in Paris and I want to live in, and I want to learn the guitar. And exactly. And, you know, yeah. who has time for all this stuff? And then I get overwhelmed. Yes. Let's um, let's talk about the shadow side of things just real briefly to like kind of wrap it up because there's so many yeah. wonderful things you know and then the awareness that the shadow side what is the shadow side of these aspects yeah. and how can we use you know with that awareness how can we use it for yeah I love that so um, the shadow and I'm sure people listening to your podcast understand what your shadow is just to simplify it the shadow um, our shadow is the parts of ourselves that we don't want anyone else to see. And often we don't want to acknowledge ourselves. These are the part of ourselves that we carry shame around. Um, when it comes to human design, there's every part of our 
our chart, you know, there's a shadow of our type, of our strategy, of our authority, of our profile, of our gates, everything, right? And really what that means, and again, through the Gene Keys and the, the incredible teachings of Richard Rudd, he really explains it the best, I feel. And he's like, there is no way but through. First, we must acknowledge and own our shadows. We must see them and we must say, yes, that is us. And as we start to acknowledge and accept them, then we start to move through to what he calls the gift. And these are the hot, these are the doing. This is how we we do these energies in the world. Um, you know, he talks just to the, the gene keys to the gates, but let's say for a projector, for you, a shadow of being a projector, well, your signature is success. So if you're in your shadow, shadow, you're going to be hustling your butt. You're going to be doing, doing, doing. You're going to be running around. You're going to be getting everything done. And you and the people around you are going to be succeeding, but you're going to be burning out. That's the shadow. Um, you have to own it. You have to say, yep, that's me. And you have to own the part of your ego that's like, well, that's how I get seen. I get seen when I hustle. And then you want to move to this place where you're like, okay, well, I acknowledge those things actually aren't correct for me. And you start to consciously identify when you're doing that shadow behavior or you're being that shadow expression. And you just then make a different choice. So what would that choice be for you as a projector? Well, you'd, be, you'd stop hustling and you'd pay attention to the invitations. What at, What are you being invited into right now? So don't worry about all the things your mind says you should be covering. Just focus on the invitations because when you focus on the invitations, then you're moving in alignment with your soul's purpose, with your energy, all the things. So it's very much about becoming conscious of it, accepting it, acknowledging it, and then making a new choice to be more in alignment with your true energies or with your aligned and potentials of your energies. Uh, I mean, that's like gold right there. That pay attention to the invitations. That's the wisdom I need to hear in this time right now. El Camino provides. Yeah, exactly. Like, whoa, that was such a gift. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. The universe says you're welcome. I'm not doing anything. I'm just opening my mouth. And as an MG, I'm just responding. <laughs> so cool. Well, thank you so much. Your energy is amazing. You look beyond fantastic for 49. And, oh, thank um, you. Yeah, congratulations on, on this next phase of life for you and all of us um, yeah. in the next few years. And uh, where can people find you? Okay, so you can find your free chart or anything that I do at the website, which is emmadunwoody.com. Um, you can go and check out the podcast, which is the Human Design Podcast. Um, and you can get your free chart on the website. I think I said that already. And of course, if you really want to have a chat to me, then go and find me on Instagram. It's the Human Design Coach. And um, drop me a note in my DMs and I will get back to you because I love chatting to people. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah. And do you offer sessions still with people? Um, so I don't offer sessions myself anymore, but I have the most incredible team. Again, you can find them on the website. Um, just click on book a session and they will transform your world. Woo. Oh my gosh. This is so cool. I'm, I, it's, it's the best. Well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, take care. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. And make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And please rate and review us so that we can grow and reach more people. Thanks so much and be well.